Welcome. Everybody hear me? Is that, maybe that's better. My name is Barbara Geddes. I'm the chair of the political science department at UCLA. On behalf of the department, I'd like to welcome you here for the annual E. Victor Wolfenstein Memorial Lecture. The Wolfenstein Lecture honors the memory of Victor Wolfenstein, the beloved teacher of many generations of UCLA students. I know that many of you in the room are here because you took a life-changing class from Victor. And, um, right. Victor was also a wonderful colleague for those of us in the political science department who ha has been much missed. So I want to thank Judy Wolfenstein, the rest of the Wolfenstein family, and all of the other people who've contributed to make these events possible. And I also want to thank Belinda Sunu, whose uh, cheerful and unstinting work makes th this event and many other political science department events uh, possible. <laughs> so it's, I, I know that it, anybody who's had any contact with Belinda is clapping now because she's such a, a wonderful person, a treasure for the department. Okay, so tonight we're delighted to have Judge Lance Ito uh, to speak to us about uh, Lessons Lost, the World War II incarceration of Japanese Americans. Judge Ito was born and raised in Los Angeles. He got his BA at UCLA and his law degree from UC Berkeley. He discovered Victor Wolfenstein when he took a class on Woody Guthrie and the politics of protest. So that brings back memories, right? Um, Judge Ito joined the LA County District Attorney's Office in 1977. He was one of the first four lawyers to staff the Hardcore Gangs Unit, which developed the model for dealing with gang-related crime that has been used in the rest of the country since then. He was appointed to Los Angeles Superior Court um, in 1989 and served there until he retired just a couple of years ago. So Judge Ito has been an ardent advocate for equal language access to the courts. Uh, that has been one of his contributions to the Los Angeles um, courts and criminal justice system. He has served on the Judicial Council Court Interpreters Advisory Panel and taught the effective use of spoken language interpreters to other judges. Um, so on behalf of the Department of Political Science, I am honored to welcome Judge Ito. Thank you very much, Professor. Let me do a quick mic check since I'm using a lavalier mic here. Okay, we're good to go. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you to the department for this invitation, especially thank you to Judy and to the family for inviting me to do this. Frankly, I'm curious as to how you managed to talk me into doing this <laughs> since I'm retired and I don't need to do stuff like this anymore. Um, This is going to be from a personal family perspective. I know most of you who have attended this lecture or lectures like it in the past, normally it's a professor who has been studying some academic who's been studying some particular topic uh, for a number of years. This is going to be different because I'm going to tell you about my family experience and how it affected me personally, my family, my friends, my community. Uh, and the real reason I'm here is because, as the professor noted, I, back in 1971, I was, in fact, a member of the class, Political Science 119, 
special studies, and it was Woody Guthrie and the Politics of Protest. Uh, 1971 was a fascinating year because Joan Baez's uh, album uh, just came out, uh, but, and obviously the big deal was the war in Vietnam. And I was nearing the end of my 2S student deferment, and I, my draft number was number 45, so I was uh, a little concerned. Now, <laughs> what's this about? Victor was picky about who got into his seminars. This was a uh, honors seminar, and you had to audition to get into the class. You had to come in, you had to sing a song, and explain to him why it was relevant. And so I went in, and with my Martin 0015, uh, I sang Lay to Lady Lay by Bob Dylan. <laughs> and you, you ask yourself, what, what does that got to do with protest? And obviously nothing. But I told him, I just learned this song. The girls like the song. And if you can get the girls to listen, maybe you can persuade them to do other things. <laughs> so he said, OK, you're in. I learned later that he actually had uh, a D18 Martin, which was the dreadnought size Martin and is the standard of comparison for steel string acoustic guitars. And he really liked guitars. So we wound up spending a lot of time talking about guitars in general and Martin guitars in particular. So this evening, uh, I wanted to just sort of touch on some of the things we talked about in class that are relevant to today. Uh, the song Deportee, also known as the plane crash at Los Gatos Canyon. Woody Guthrie wrote this uh, in about 1948, and it had to do with a plane crash where there were these Mexican farm workers who were being deported. The plane crashed, and the names of those deportees were never published anywhere, and those names were lost. And interestingly, as I mentioned, Joan Baez covered this song in 1971 on her album, and interestingly, when she was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, last year, this is the song she chose to sing as her induction song. Um, I Ain't Got No Home uh, was something written also by Woody in the late 40s. And then it was modified in 1950 uh, because he was uh, unhappy about the apartment complex that he was living in and it was uh, owned by the uh, Trump Organization. <laughs> and the amazing thing is, I never knew about this song until recently, and now you, got, you students today are so lucky. You can just Google this stuff, and there it is. You can go to YouTube right now, and you can see a video of, uh, you can hear an audio of Woody singing, I Ain't Got No Home, Old Man Trump, right now. And we could never find this. Uh, but this is the, the lyric that I, I think is of interest. I suppose old man Trump knows just how much racial hate he stirred up in the blood pot of human hearts when he dried that color line here at his 1800 family project. And essentially he was complaining about the fact that African Americans were not allowed to rent in any of the Trump properties. What's fascinating is that because I was the eighth best student in Victor's class that year, <laughs> My prize was this pamphlet that he wrote in 1969. And in it, he compares the father relationship of some historical characters, uh, Winston Churchill, Malcolm X, and Frederick Nietzsche, and how these political figures relate to the father figures in their life. And I'm so sad I didn't get a chance to ask Victor, how would you evaluate this father's son? relationship. So anyway, and then of course this land is your land, this land is my land, uh, Woody Guthrie's most famous song which interestingly if you were paying attention or went to any of the campaign rallies over the last two months on the midterm elections you've heard this song a thousand times. Most recently Oprah Winfrey uh, in Georgia. No, it's, it, it's in, it's Beach Haven Apartments, and it's in Brooklyn, New York. Beach Haven. Uh, I want to uh, 
share with you two events from my life that I'm going to tie up a little later. This is a generic picture of a picnic. Uh, when I was seven years old in 1957, I went to a, a picnic that was organized around the Japanese communities. Um, we had picnics based upon what prefecture your family had emigrated from. So this was the Fukuoka Kenjin Kai picnic. In other words, it was the families whose, whose parents had emigrated from the Fukuoka uh, prefecture in the southern part of Japan. And so I was at this picnic. I'm seven years old, and I'm playing with some kids. And my dad comes over, takes me by the arm, and leads me away. And he said, I don't want you to play with the kids from that family. Now, in my growing up, in my youth, my parents often told me they didn't want me to be playing with kids from that family. So it, this wasn't anything unusual, but it sort of stuck in my mind that I'd had no idea who those kids were or why that was a bad family. Uh, second uh, event in my life uh, has to do with this book, Fair Harford. Uh, my best friend in, in high school, uh, his dad had gone to NYU and had gone to uh, Harvard Law School. And he was trying to encourage us to, eat, to consider going to college uh, in the Ivy League. Uh, I was 16 at the time. And, um, he, and, and the, in the alternative, he wanted us to either go to Cal or Stanford. Uh, but he gave me this book, and he uh, sold me on the virtues of going to the Ivy League. And so I, and you kids in, are so lucky today. You ha when I was a kid, you had to do a whole lot of research about where you were going to go to college. You had to write to them. You had to ask them for, to mail you stuff. You can't just go online and look at their website and say, yeah. I mean, it was a lot of work. So I was doing that lot of work. And one day, uh, I, went, I came to the dinner table. I showed my mom and dad this book. And I discussed with them the virtues of going to the Ivy League. And I told them, I think I want to go to Brown. So the next day, when my dad came home from work, he said, I need to talk to you. So I said, OK. So we walked into the backyard. We had a little table behind the garage. And we sat down at the table. And he said, never, ever, ever tell your mother that we've had this conversation. Do you understand? And I said, and I, I, it must have been the, the dumbfounded look on my face. He said, ever. <laughs> Do you understand? And I said, I got the message. He said, you cannot go to the Ivy League. You can't go to Stanford. You can't even go to USC. I mean, low, low standard there. Um, <laughs> that's for my friends from SC. He said, during the war, when the war broke out, we had a farm in the San Gabriel Valley. I borrowed money from family and friends for the down payment. I borrowed money from family and friends for the farm equipment and for the fertilizer and the seed. When we got interned, we lost everything. And we've been digging ourselves out of that hole ever since. So he said, you're not going to Harvard. You're not going to Brown. He said, you can go to the community college, LACC, and maybe you can go to UCLA if you want to commute. Of course, remember, this is 1967, and you could actually drive from Los Feliz to Westwood <laughs> in 25 minutes. So it wasn't, wasn't a completely crazy idea. So anyway. So remember those two events. One of the things that after Judy coerced me into doing this, um, I saw an article in the New York Times that just dumbfounded me. And it was reported on a survey that said that the memory of the Holocaust is fading from memory, that people are forgetting about this. And then on the ride home, I heard the same report on NPR. How is it that something as 
enormous and outrageous as the Holocaust, how can that possibly fade from memory? And we know the dangers of that just from what happened in Squirrel Hill 10 days ago. So I compare this with my family's experience in the incarceration of the Japanese during the Second World War. This is the typical paragraph in your typical high school history book that deals with the entirety of the internment. That's it. So the, in, the lessons from the Japanese internment aren't lost. They've never been taught in the first place. I see a lot of people nodding. My dear wife was born in Ohio, and she went to high school at Linwood High School. And when we got married and started on our relationship, uh, I would take her to family events. And going to Heart Mountain Reunion, Heart Mountain was one of the relocation centers, and my parents would go to the internee reunions faithfully. And occasionally, Peggy and I would go with them. Sometimes the reunions were here in Southern California, and oftentimes they're up in Wyoming. She had no clue about any of this stuff. She would constantly say, you're kidding. You're kidding. You're kidding. So one of the lessons that most folks don't realize is that all of this begins with what? What happened on January the 24th, 1848? Yes, gold at Sutter's Mill. That brought a large number of Chinese. Uh, one of the censuses uh, in the middle 1860s showed that there were 40,000 Chinese registered here in California, an enormous migration. Uh, California was referred to as Gold Mountain in the Chinese culture. Chinese also contributed heavily to the labor pool uh, that built the Continental Railroad. Uh, some estimates more than 40% of the railroad workers were Chinese uh, who built the Transcontinental Railroad here in the United States. This is a famous photograph, and you'll notice that there's not one Chinese face to be found. They're just a forgotten part of this history. The California Railways, Union Pacific Railways, all worked on by huge crews of Chinese. Some wonderful photos in the California State Archives. But there was growing anti-Chinese sentiment throughout California, throughout the Western United States. And this came from both sides, came from conservative groups and came from liberal groups, especially the labor movement was very anti-Chinese, Chinese immigration, uh, here in California. Uh, Chinese were referred to commonly as rat eaters, and they were precluded from testifying in courts. They were not uh, allowed to become citizens. They were deemed as aliens ineligible for citizenship. That's a key phrase, ineligible for citizenship. And the um, city of San Francisco passed special taxes that were aimed at the Chinese communities and just the Chinese. Uh, the Chi and you've heard about the massacres that occurred, the lynchings, the sort of thing. The Chinese were not well treated in California or along the western coast. Which of course brings us to Bolt Hall. This is the law school that I went to, Bolt Hall. I'm sure you've all heard of it, the flagship law school of the university. And I went there my entire career, uh, law school career, having no idea who John Henry Bolt was. But back in 18, 1877, he was one of the leading proponents for the curtailment of immigration from China and the exclusion of Chinese from California. And he was an advocate of alien land laws and a whole lot of other things. And the manner in which he characterized the Chinese population in California was less than complimentary. And this is my law school. So right now, there is, and ultimately it led to the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Which then brings us to, uh, because Chinese were then excluded, then Japanese started coming uh, to the United States. Uh, my grandfather on the Ito side went from uh, Fukuoka to Hawaii. He was uh, in Hawaii, he was a labor contractor in the pineapple fields. Uh, from there, he went to Peru 
and I have no idea why he went to Peru, but as you know, there's a very large Peruvian Japanese community there even to this day. From Peru, he went to Yuma, Arizona, where he was a lettuce farmer. From Yuma, he went to Riverside, where he ran a commercial nursery, and for a period of time, he was the head gardener at the Mission Inn uh, in Riverside. He designed the gardens, some of which are still there. He had designed the waterfalls, one of which is still there. Um, and the, the Japanese were very prolific in the uh, farm fields. And one of the things that I'm studying for next year's lecture is going to be the 1903 sugar beet strike involving uh, Mexican and Japanese farm workers uh, who struck in the sugar beet fields. Long story short, the AFL came in and offered to unionize the Mexican farm workers, but would not take the Japanese farm workers. And that probably set back um, farm labor uh, power in the Mexican community for probably the next 60 years. So, interesting story. Uh, this is one of my favorite historical pictures. This is a Japanese farmer in the San Gabriel Valley that we'll meet again. So, uh, Japanese were not exactly welcome either, and oftentimes uh, the locals couldn't tell the difference between Japanese or Chinese. A lot of bad things happened to the Japanese as well. In addition to being aliens ineligible for citizenship, uh, they were expelled from the public schools in San Francisco, same year as the earthquake. Uh, and then the legislature in California started passing a number of land laws that would, because the farmers, the white farmers in California were afraid of the competition from the Japanese. And so the Japanese couldn't own farmland and they couldn't lease farmland for any long-term period. And if the state found out that you had bought or leased land illegally under these alien land laws, that land was escheated, in other words, forfeited to the state, so a pretty heavy penalty. Which, of course, brings us, this is the Nagamori side of my family, and the young child there is my mother, my grandmother Kay, my grandfather Seichiro. This is their home in 1931 in the uh, Los Feliz district. Still a nice neighborhood, although uh, five doors up the street is the La Bianca house from the Tate La Bianca Manson murders. But next door to that is the house that Katy Perry just bought. So <laughs> she doesn't seem to mind anyway. Uh, I don't expect anybody not in the front row to be able to read this, but this is the grant deed to that home. And here's the close-up. It is granted to Toshiko Nagamori, my mother, a Native American, born of Japanese descent, single, a minor. All right, now everybody get ready to get your calculators out because we're coming to a math problem. All right, my mother was born in September of 1924. The grant deed is dated March of 1929. How old was she when she became the owner? She's four and a half years old. My grandparents went to the eminent law firm of Stanton and Stanton. They created a guardianship trust for my mother, who was then the owner of this real estate because her parents were ineligible to own that property. So. Now, you've heard a discussion about birthright citizenship. For some reason, this has become topical. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. Um, and I, I just want to make an interesting legal distinction. My grandparents on both sides were legally here in the United States. They had, these are the, their alien uh, identification cards. This is my grandpa's. Uh, commonly referred to then as a green card. Of course, no they're no longer green, but this is what it used to look like. Uh, this is Wong Art Kim, and it's the pivotal case in 1898. Wong Art Kim's parents were here in San Francisco. He was born in a home on Sacramento Street in downtown San Francisco. He then left and went to visit relatives in China a couple of times, but the third time he did this, when he came back, he was refused entry and told, you were born here, so you're still Chinese. You look Chinese, you speak Chinese, you eat Chinese food. 
you work in a Chinese industry, you're Chinese, and you can't come in because you're, you're not a citizen. You have no claim to be here in the United States. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that the 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution clearly states that if you're born here, you're a citizen. And interestingly, Justice Horace Gray uh, made an observation, and remember, this is 1898, that to hold that the 14th Amendment of the Constitution excludes from citizenship the children born in the United States of citizens or subjects of other countries would be to deny citizenship to thousands, guess what the number might be today, thousands of persons of English, Scotch, Irish, German, or other European parentage who have always been considered and treated as citizens of the United States. But the one scary part there is that Supreme Court cases are very fact specific. Query is it a different case if the parents are not legally here? Of course, the seminal event in the incarceration of the Japanese starts with Pearl Harbor. And there was a huge uh, outcry and movement against the, the Japanese who were here, be they aliens ineligible for citizenship or native-born citizens. Uh, this is an interesting uh, cartoon, political cartoon, and you'll notice the style. This is um, Theodore Geisel, also known as Dr. Seuss. And you'll note that uh, he has made this unfounded accusation of treason and sabotage. You notice his racist caricature of Japanese as slyly grinning with pig noses and slanted eyes. Uh, he was one of the leading voices for the ouster of the Japanese uh, from the West Coast. And as we know from his cartoons uh, depicting African Americans, uh, he would depict them with exaggerated simian characteristics. And we know from the auction of his cartoons last year that the N-word was a very casual and common part of his vocabulary. Dr. Seuss never apologized for the outrage and the hysteria that he stirred up with his cartoons. And I believe he's an evil man. Next time you see a Dr. Seuss product, give that some thought. <laughs> Executive Order 9066 was issued in February of 1942. And the obligation to carry out the executive order, which established uh, Western defense zones and then gave the military authorities the right to exclude or to determine who got to stay there, this authority was granted to this gentleman, Lieutenant General John DeWitt. John DeWitt, uh, shortly after 9066 was promulgated, testified in front of a congressional committee and essentially said a Jap is a Jap, and it makes no difference whether or not they're a citizen or not. And this is the guy in charge. About a week after um, war broke out, in middle to late December of 1941, uh, my, parent, my grandparents on the Nagamori side were visited uh, by federal authorities. They did not recollect if this was the FBI or Naval Intelligence or the other federal agencies that were involved in the war effort, but they were visited and their home was searched. And they took my grandpa's uh, Kodak camera, they took his Zenith shortwave radio, and gave them a receipt, and of course, they never saw those things again. They also searched the house because they were looking for firearms. I often wondered how it was that these federal agents knew where to go. And uh, as you know, there is some controversy today about the misuse of census data in general, and in particular, citizenship questions. And so I asked a good friend of mine, can you get me a copy of the 1940 census for my grandpa's uh, home? And of course, she was able to do so. Uh, this is the page from the 1940 census. Uh, question 10 is color or race, and they're listed as being Japanese. And in question 16, they're listed as being aliens. So this was the information, and there was an article uh, not long ago in, in May that the, it was a 
document found in the archives that the federal agents did, in fact, go to the Census Bureau and did collect this information about the whereabouts of uh, so-called enemy aliens uh, from the census. So this is a situation where despite the law saying you can't use it for stuff like this, it was. Um, this, as you reckon, this is my grandpa Jotaro Ito, and he's on our plow horse Queenie, and the shotgun is a Harrington and Richardson 410 shotgun single shot break action. Those of you familiar with firearms know that this is the kind of firearm that a farmer would have. This is something a farmer would use for, you know, rats. And in particular, the reason my family had it in the San Gabriel Valley was rattlesnakes, uh, which were common in the fields there. My grandpa decided he's not giving up his gun. And so the barrel was very crudely sawed off, and this gun was hidden in a piece of furniture for the duration of the war. And that shotgun is now in my possession as a treasured family relic. This is the notice that was posted outside my uh, grandmother uh, Nagamori's home on St. George Street in Los Feliz. And I know you can't read that, but essentially it says you've got six days. They were told this was directed to all persons of Japanese ancestry in the city of Los Angeles on May the 3rd and they were to be evacuated six days later at noon. So they had six days to wrap up their affairs and report to the uh, church uh, in downtown LA. Uh, it's a common phrase in the Japanese community, only what we could carry, because that's essentially what, what they were relegated to. Uh, notice the one, bottom one, no pets. This, this breaks my heart because I'm a dog lover. Uh, this is an exhibit at the Heart Mountain Wyoming Interpretive Center, the museum there. And essentially, they're talking about the heartbreak that a lot of the kids had because they had to leave their pets behind. Now, I spent five years as the emergency preparedness coordinator for the LA Superior Court uh, preparing for disasters and earthquakes and floods and fires and all that sort of fun stuff. And we would always study events in other jurisdictions for the lessons that we could learn. And if you recollect, there are some very famous photographs from Hurricane Katrina showing people on their roofs with nine feet of flood water sitting on the roof with their dog because the FEMA authorities would not let people take their pets with them, so people declined to be evacuated. So now, thankfully, because of that experience, they have, uh, FEMA has changed its regulations and they make accommodations, some, we, some accommodations for pets. But I'm a, I'm a dog lover, so this touched my heart when I, when I saw that, uh, because I, I would want to take my dog. Um, the Historical Society of Arcadia, 10 years ago, acknowledged the role of the Santa Anita racetrack in the incarceration of the Japanese, and they had a wonderful historical exhibit uh, that was focused around the Santa Anita Assembly Center. The assembly centers were where the Japanese first went. You know, there are, there are two things. There are the assembly centers, and then there are the internment camps. The assembly centers were meant to be temporary until the camps were ready. And primarily, these were racetracks and fairgrounds. My mother's family, as you saw from the notice, had to go to the Santa Anita uh, racetrack, which is why we're not wild about going there. And my father's family was then sent to the fairgrounds at Pomona. And just recently, within the last two years, the LA County finally acknowledged the participation of the fairgrounds in, in that incarceration. And there's now a historical marker there uh, that you can see. Of course, they put it on the edge of the fairgrounds where nobody can see it. But uh, this is a photograph. You can see that they, these carpenters are preparing modular uh, walls to be made into barracks for the Japanese in the parking lots of the San Anita racetrack. You can see the main grandstands there that are there, still there today, and you can see, of course, the San Gabriel Mountains in the background. This is what the camp looked like, part of it. And obviously, there was a presence of the military because they were being incarcerated. Uh, the gun nuts in the uh, audience will recognize the uh, 30 caliber Browning water-cooled belt-fed machine gun. So that's a serious piece of artillery. 
uh, the Mochita family, uh, every family had to have one of these tags. Every member got a tag and they had to wear this when they reported to be incarcerated. So you can see the Mochita family, everybody's got one of these tags. And it, obviously it was chaos on May the 9th when everybody had to show up at the Japanese church in downtown to get on buses to be taken out to Santa Anita. They were greeted by this huge military presence. They were searched and then searched again. And then they had to go through medical screenings. And then this is something everybody would love. If you think the DMV was bad, <laughs> getting organized, getting people assigned to housing units, living units, can you imagine the hours that were spent in line? In lines for everything. This is the line for lunch. And as you can see the food, uh, my mom told me that it was essentially beans and uh, occasional uh, fruits and white bread is what they got to eat. And another interesting thing is my mom told me that this whole system for many years disrupted the family relationship because, because they had to eat in mess halls and you had to line up and go, that the kids would go with the other kids, the kids, you know, all the kids would group together. You didn't have the family units in the, in the barracks, in the dining hall. And of course they were guarded 24 hours a day. And some of the unlucky got to live in the horse stalls. And the shower facilities and bathroom facilities were in the horse stalls. So while they were cooling their heels for a couple of months in the assembly centers, the War Relocation Authority was preparing the relocation camps in various parts of the United States. This was a long process because there wasn't a state in the United States that wanted one of these camps in their borders. And the governors and the state legislatures pushed back and nobody wanted any of these things anywhere close to them. Um, as you can see that predominantly they are in obscure, out of the way places and they're predominantly high desert in very isolated locations. And there were 10 of these camps around the United States. You can Google this, that's why I'm gonna fly through this but this is a fascinating picture this is the day when everybody at Santa Anita got loaded up on trains for a uh, three-day two-night journey from Santa Anita to where they didn't know they were going and they wound up in Heart Mountain Wyoming uh, this is a fascinating picture that was taken by Ansel Adams the famous photographer he took a series of photographs in the Manzanar camp and a number of other uh, similar photos during the Second World War. This is the children's village at Manzanar. There were uh, just under 300 children in various orphanages and foster care facilities around California, Washington, and Oregon at the outbreak of the Second World War. And obviously these kids are dangerous enemy aliens, so they needed to be rounded up out of, these foster, out of foster care and out of the orphanages and taken to the children's village in Manzanar. So this is, this is them. Now I want to talk to you about um, Heart Mountain Camp in particular in Wyoming, and I'll, I'll get to why in a second. Obviously my family was there. Um, it was very challenging, uh, you know, eating is a big part of being incarcerated, you know, it's nice to get three meals a day. Uh, they had over 11,000 people that had to be fed. Every ethnic community has their own particular taste in cuisine. Uh, the WRA had a wonderful budget of 15 cents a meal uh, for the internees. And obviously, given the war uh, effort, this was not a priority feeding them. Uh, the, they were rather harsh conditions there in Heart Mountain. Uh, and what was interesting to my dad as a farmer uh, was that it was a very short growing season 
only about 110 to 120 days. Uh, and this is kind of what it looked like in the wintertime, as you can imagine, a little cold. There were more challenges because this was high desert. The rainfall was less than even we get here in LA, four to six inches, so no farmer could depend on four to six inches for irrigation. And as I mentioned, the limited growing season. But they also had resources amongst these 11,000 internees in Heart Mountain, there were 500 farmers from Washington, Oregon, and, and California. Since the internees had nothing to do, they had no jobs, so might as well go outside and work in the garden. Uh, the camp administration was mostly cooperative because they saw the benefit if the internees could grow their own food. And there was a lot of open and flat land there. This is just basically what the Heart Mountain Plateau looks like. And you can see the Shoshone River down there at the bottom. Uh, this is from an exhibit at the Heart Mountain Interpretive Center, and they noted that there were two men who had, who had uh, outstanding credentials as far as farm management was concerned. Uh, first, uh, James Ito, and then he was succeeded when James Ito left the camp to go to the Army. Uh, by uh, Aichi Sakaue, which interestingly is not a relation to our Chief Justice. I was surprised at that. And he did write a book that has a fabulous number of wonderful photographs if you have a chance to see it. <coughs> this is uh, Aichi at the, uh, in an exhibit uh, extolling his efforts to feed the internees uh, there at Heart Mountain. Uh, this is my family. This is my grandpa, Chukaro, on the left, my grandma, Kiku, and brothers and sisters. This is my dad. And my dad's family, uh, after uh, coming to Los Angeles, ran a uh, fruit and vegetable store, uh, first at the corner of Hollywood Boulevard in Cahuenga, and then later on Colorado Boulevard in Glendale. So we were familiar with, with farming. Uh, I love this picture, which is why you're going to see it four more times. Uh, my dad went to um, Cal Aggies, which was the agriculture campus of the University of California. It's now UC Davis. Uh, he graduated from Berkeley with a degree in soil science and farm management. And um, of course, this is, this is what? A post turtle. What do we know about post turtles? He, d he didn't there get there by himself. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. I'll pay you later. <laughs> My dad was very insistent that any time we talked about what he did at Heart Mountain as being the farm manager who started the farm project and got the inmates fed, he said, you have to remember, I was one of 150 people working on this. I just got got the cushy job, I got to sit in the office while everybody else was out there doing it. So he said, make sure anytime you talk about this that you make sure everybody knows it took a whole lot of people to make this happen. And he made sure I had this list of all the people and all the supervisors and all the different things that they did there. And it's an extensive list as you can see. Uh, this is Glenn Hartman, who was ostensibly the guy in charge, and the young lady that he's gripping too tightly on the left is my Auntie Dorothy, and so she worked in the office, so my dad had an in inside intel anytime something interesting was going to happen. So my dad's first job was to go out, because he was a soil scientist, to go around the area and sample the soil to see what would grow where. And he killed 17 rattlesnakes while he was out there. He says, no, they don't chase, taste like chicken. <laughs> he sent those soil samples to the University of Wyoming at Laramie. They sent him back the results. And then he made a plot as to what, what crop should be planted where. And luckily, we had some, uh, farm, some farm supply store people in, as inmates in the camp who still had seed supplies uh, back in Southern California. They were able to rescue, have friends rescue uh, some church members uh, from other faiths and other ethnic persuasions who were not interned 
rescued the seeds and sent them to them there at Heart Mountain so that they could grow Japanese vegetables. Uh, they had to clear more than 1,700 acres. And the bad news is they didn't have a lot of equipment. So a lot of it was done by hand. The good news is that uh, because they only had four to six inches of rainfall, that the Shoshone River was a mile away. The bad news was that the Shoshone River was a mile <laughs> away. So while they were out clearing the land and, and preparing the field for the crops, the other cr there was another work crew that was out there making the irrigation ditch. And interestingly, they were able to take water by siphoning out of this irrigation ditch. They didn't have, have pumps, so they had to use these elaborate siphon systems to irrigate the field. Another re thing, because it was such a short growing season, they had to create these little mini hothouses. And what they did is they made these wood frames and then cover them and then started the seeds growing in the hot frames. Then they transferred the seedlings out into the fields and covered them with what they call hot caps. Basically, this is newspaper that's been wet and formed and then stuck on top so that it creates a, a thermal barrier and, it, and uh, helps the growth of the seedlings. Needless to say, this is real labor intensive. This is getting on your knees, down, planting the seedlings, and putting these caps on top of them, and making sure that they get watered. And you can see the water in the, in the uh, field there. Phenomenal results. Tons and tons of produce. And the good news is some of it was Japanese, like daikon and the, Jap the Japanese radishes that they really wanted to have. And I love this picture just because it's one of the few color pictures that exists of the camp uh, at the time. This is my dad in the uh, melon field. And as you can see, that field goes on for quite a while, so quite a project. They were able to make enough food that they were able to send the by truck uh, produce to the other camps around in the immediate area. One of his proudest accomplishments was this root cellar. Those of you, uh, none of you know what a root cellar is, I can tell. <laughs> but in certain parts of the world, because you don't have refrigeration, you can't, you can't can all this stuff. In order to pre preserve vegetables for use later in the year, you make a root cellar where you can control the, the humidity and the temperature. You'll, you'll notice the ventilation vents on the top. You can see how big this is by the truck that's coming out. This was one of my dad's proudest accomplishments was this root cellar. And to have, you know, a million and a half pounds of produce stored in this root cellar was quite an accomplishment. This is what it looked like about five years ago. Uh, I was lucky enough to get permission from the landowner who, who owned it at the time to go in to look at it. And to give you a sense of perspective, all the way at the end of the photograph is a Chevrolet station wagon. So this is the size of a football field inside there. And it was engineered well enough. I mean, this was taken five years ago. So it was engineered well enough that the roof is still intact. The sides are still intact. It's still a structurally intact uh, building. So a pretty amazing accomplishment. Luckily, it has since been restored. Uh, we got a parks grant. The Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation got a parks grant. It's been restored. And you can actually go and visit it if you uh, should care. There was also a major chicken and hog farming uh, protein meat uh, operation at Heart Mountain that my dad was also in charge of. So uh, let's skip forward then to the Japanese men in the camp. When the war broke out, any, any Japanese American or Japanese alien who was in the military was then thrown out of the military. Japanese, be they citizens or aliens, were then ineligible for service in the U.S. military. Then, six months later, okay, if you want to volunteer, we'll put you in a segregated unit of all Japanese guys. And then, well, we think we're going to draft you. So they started a draft. So these are some, some of the men from the Heart Mountain, Wyoming, a foundation. These are guys who've already uh, completed their medical, and you can see they have, some of them have bags, and they're ready to report for induction. 
So despite the fact that their families are being incarcerated involuntarily, they went to serve. Uh, at Heart Mountain, there is an honor roll that lists all the men who served in the military during the Second World War. That's my mom there. And as you can see, the Ito family is well represented. Uh, we come from a family of samurai, so being a warrior is not outrageous. This is my dad uh, leaving Heart Mountain. And because he was college educated, could read and write Japanese, uh, he was not allowed to volunteer for the 442nd, and he was instead assigned to the military intelligence service. And he um, was prepared as an interpreter for the invasion and occupation of Japan, and he in fact did that. And then later he spent a year in Korea uh, as a, an interpreter, because as you know, Korea at the time of the Second World War was a colony of Japan. Uh, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team was the most highly decorated military unit of its size of any military unit in the history of the United States. This is a photograph of President Truman, and you can see the Pentagon in the background honoring the 442nd when they returned. And to his credit, if you recall, shortly after this event, uh, he issued the order to desegregate the military. The other side of the coin is this gentleman, Pak Hoshizaki, when he was 19. When he turned 19, uh, and you can see the barracks in the background at Heart Mountain, he was then given a draft notice. And he essentially said, hell no, I won't go. He said, how can you reasonably ask me when you've, you've ripped my family out of their homes, away from their businesses, away from their jobs, away from their loved ones, and stuck us here in this godforsaken prairie of Heart Mountain, Wyoming, and now you want me to go fight in the army? Hell no. 63 young men from Heart Mountain said, hell no. And they refused the military draft. They either refused induction or they refused to report for the uh, medical uh, evaluation. And they were charged, indicted in what is still the largest criminal prosecution in the history of that federal district uh, up there in Wyoming. And the lesson here, obviously, is the moral power of resistance. Now, my mom and dad, who are in this photograph, this is a photograph of perfect attendees. These are the people who have attended every Heart Mountain reunion. Uh, so this is the perfect attendance group. <laughs> And I would accompany my parents to these things on occasion, but it was always interesting that there's a tension, there has always been a tension between the resistor families and the families who served in the military. And there were some hard words, hard feelings. A lot, a lot of the, the 442nd people, a lot of the uh, MIS people said, those guys are cowards. They didn't want to fight. They were afraid to fight. And the Japanese who served in the military, they said, we have to go and fight and die to prove that we're loyal. And that's the only way we're going to do this. Hard feelings. And even at these reunions, when my parents were in their 70s and 80s, they were hard feelings. And I found out why my dad had grabbed me at that picnic and pulled me away. It was a resistor family. But I got to tell you, you know, and I, my heart had, had for a long time uh, been with the 442nd with the military guys, and it still is. But I respect the resistance. Uh, this is talking my mom having dinner a year ago. Some good news. Um, my mom and dad met at Heart Mountain. And they got married in July of 1945. The war is still going on. And my dad finally got out of the Army in 1947. Uh, when he came home, you know, I, I, as a young teenager, I asked him, so all my uncles were in the 442nd. You know, they've got bronze stars and purple hearts and all, this, all these military decorations. What did you do? 
when he, w- when he left the military, he was ordered never to discuss the special project. And he said, until somebody tells me I can talk about it, I can't tell you. He said, but I can tell you this, it was interesting and it was important. But sadly, I never found out what it was. Now, Korematsu. This is the most famous Supreme Court case uh, coming out of the, the internment. Uh, Fred refused to report for the internment. Uh, he essentially stayed home, and they finally got around to finding him a couple of weeks later, and he was convicted and that convic- uh, for refusing the order, and that conviction was affirmed uh, by the United States Supreme Court, and pay attention to the date, December 18, 1944. And the essential logic was that the, the war needs and the fear of sabotage and espionage outweighed the civil rights of the Japanese American community, be they citizens or not. And the vote was six to three. The more interesting legal case, however, is ex parte Endo. Mitsui Endo, at the time of the war broke out, uh, was a clerk at the California DMV. And it's interesting to note that the state of California fired Japanese American employees because they were, were labeled as being disloyal. The city of Los Angeles fired all of their Japanese American employees because they were deemed to be disloyal. The county of Los Angeles fired all of their Japanese American employees because they were deemed disloyal. Sui Endo, when she got to uh, Tule Lake, she had a lawyer file a, writ, a petition for writ of habeas corpus. In other words, you have to justify why you're holding this body. Interestingly, on the same day as Korematsu, they, the Supreme Court said this, the incarceration of the Japanese was justified by the war needs. However, you cannot continue to incarcerate people who are conceitedly and admittedly loyal. And interestingly, this was a nine-zip opinion on the same day as Korematsu. Now, Fred (coughs) was given the Medal of Freedom, deservedly. And interestingly, in 1983, his conviction was overturned by a federal court in San Francisco as it was found in the archives that there were several reports from the FBI and Naval Intelligence that there was no threat from the Japanese American community that the evidence that had been presented in court and on appeal was bogus and that the government had concealed this information from the courts and that there was no justification for the Korematsu conviction in any shape or form. An article in the New York Times in 2014, however, on the anniversary of one of the, the seminal events of the incarceration noted that Korematsu is still good law. It's still on the books and has never been overruled. Uh, Let me back up a second here. As you know, Trump versus Hawaii, uh, my favorite justice on the Supreme Court, Justice Sotomayor, raised the Korematsu issue in that case and drew a comparison to the logic uh, behind Korematsu with the president's exclusion of people from Muslim countries. And uh, Sotomayor is my favorite justice because she was actually a courtroom prosecutor in the state courts. She was actually a trial court judge, and she was actually a trial trial court uh, lawyer, unlike most of the other folks on the Supreme Court who are academics. She knows what it's like to be a trial judge and have somebody say, yes, I can be a fair juror. Anyway. Let me read to you Justice Roberts' response to Sotomayor. Finally, the dissent invokes Korematsu versus the United States. Whatever rhetorical advantage the dissent may see in doing so, Korematsu has nothing to do with this case. The forcible relocation of U.S. citizens to concentration camps solely and explicitly on the basis of race is objectively unlawful and outside the scope of presidential authority. But it is wholly inapt to liken that morally repugnant order to a facially neutral policy denying certain foreign nationals the privilege of admission. 
the entry suspension is an act that is well within the executive authority and could have been taken by any other president. The only question is evaluating the actions of this particular president in promulgating an otherwise valid proclamation. The dissent's reference to Korematsu, however, affords this court the opportunity to make express what is already obvious. Korematsu was gravely wrong the day it was decided and has been overruled in the court of history and to be clear, has no place in law under the Constitution, period. Now, the court staff who writes the syllabus for this opinion, the syllabus is where the court staff says the court held A, B, C, and D. The syllabus does not include a point saying, and the court overruled Korematsu. I wish Justice Roberts had added four words, is therefore overruled. Would have been simple. I'm not as competent as some of the people who think that Korematsu has been overruled. Next time I see Justice Roberts, I'll mention this to him. <laughs> All right. So the Japanese are now being released from the camps and allowed to go home. And of course, they were welcomed with open arms, as I'm sure you would expect. Uh, the governor of Washington uh, vehemently opposed the return of the Japanese to Washington. Farm, farm groups all over the, the American West opposed the return of the Japanese. Now, this is uh, the permission card issued to my grandmother Nagamori. You'll note the date is the 17th of December 1944, the day before Korematsu and the day before Inre Endo. And there are stories that go around that the staff of the Supreme Court warned the War Relo Relocation Authority that this was coming, that they were going to issue a proclamation that they're going to, you got to let these people go if they're loyal citizens. So you better get ready. And my grandma was the first in line, and she got her permit to, to go back home on the 17th of December. Um, my family's experience coming back to Southern California was painful. And it's something that I cannot easily discuss. Um, just an example, my grandmother, when she came back, the market in the neighborhood would not sell her groceries. The gas station would not pump gas for them. Um, they were refused services all over Los Feliz and Silver Lake. Uh, the market that's now the Trader Joe's in Silver Lake refused service to them. And it's not Trader Joe's, by the way. It wasn't Trader Joe's. We love, we love Trader Joe's. <laughs> My uh, grandmother had to go down to Chinatown where she could pass as Chinese to buy groceries and buy other goods. Uh, our home was vandalized a dozen times. Um, uh, she, my mom was interviewed for this uh, documentary, uh, Legacy of Heart Mountain. Um, and thanks to YouTube, you can go to YouTube and you can find this, uh, the excerpts or the whole documentary. And it's really well done. Uh, it was done by David Ono and uh, Jeff McIntyre, and they deservedly won Emmy Awards uh, for this documentary. But um, suffice to say, it was not a happy time. So, of course, there are plenty of villains to go around in this story, Dr. Seuss being one of my favorites. Um, but how about some heroes? How about a good message? That, of course, brings us to the Boy Scouts. Uh, you can see the uh, Heart Mountain, and this is a Boy Scout parade. Uh, this is a picture from the Japanese Methodist Episcopal Church in 1931 on Normandy Street in Los Angeles. The distinguished gentleman in the lower left-hand corner in the three-piece suit is my grandpa Nagamori. And he was influential in, in sponsoring, although he never had a son. I guess he wanted a son because he was one of the participants in the Boy Scouts there. 
The Boy Scouts were one of the few national organizations that did not abandon the Japanese community. Uh, in Heart Mountain, there were so many young boys that they had seven Boy Scout troops and four Cub Scout packs. And you might recognize these two gentlemen, Senator Alan Simpson, Republican from Wyoming, and Norm Mineta, former mayor of San Jose, served in the House, Secretary of uh, Commerce under Clinton, Secretary of Transportation under Bush, and he's the one who gave the order to put the planes on the ground on 9-11, if you recollect. These two guys shared a tent at a Boy Scout jamboree sponsored by the Cody Boy Scouts uh, during the war, and they remain friends today. Uh, and as you know, Norm now owns a, an airport in Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It said his name is on it. I, don't know. I assume he gets something from it. Uh, Jimmy Carter created a commission to examine the fallout and the causes of wartime incarceration. This is the Congressional Gold Medal, the bill to award the Japanese soldiers the Congressional Gold Medal was carried by my then Congressman Adam Schiff. Uh, this is a photograph of President Obama signing the declaration authorizing the striking of the medal. Uh, you can see Senator Dan Inouye from Hawaii and behind him is Adam Schiff. Uh, I see Mike Honda and a couple of other uh, Japanese American legislators there. Uh, sadly, my dad was not able to attend because he was ill. As you can see, that's a hospital bed and a hospital gown. Uh, but uh, Congressman Schiff arranged for him to be awarded his medal. And this is me showing the picture to Adam Schiff, and we're grateful to him for the recognition. And this is part of the proclamation. Of course, this brings us to John Marshall High School. And you probably recognize John Marshall High School since this facade, this classic Gothic facade, has been used by, uh, uh, in a number of movies. And this is Bruce Kirkpatrick. This is one of our heroes. When the Japanese students were taken out of John Marshall High School and sent to the Santa Anita uh, Assembly Center from the neighborhood around the school, he said, this is wrong. He had his teachers mail to all of our, their students their textbooks, had uh, a high school teacher who was there proctor their tests, and allowed them to graduate with the summer class of 1942. One of the proud possessions of the Ito family is this diploma that Bruce Kirkpatrick delivered to my mother at Santa Anita Assembly Center when she graduated with the class of 1942 unlike many, many other Nisei. Um, in 2004, the California legislature amended the education code to allow the awarding of high school diplomas to the Nisei who didn't have this opportunity. So Bruce Kirkpatrick was a hero. I have the commencement program for all the kids who walked across the stage in June uh, of 1942, and my mom's name is in that program. Japanese, Japanese Americans were allowed to leave if they could find a college that would take them. My mom got to go to the, the Methodist College, National College in Kansas City, Missouri, and we're forever grateful to them for taking her in. Uh, while she was there, she met a, a gentleman uh, who operated a Methodist uh, camp, a family camp in North Carolina, uh, Camp Junaliska. And this is a photograph of the, of the 150 campers in the summer of 1943. And of course, in every photograph, you know, there's somebody who's, who's got to do this, but that's not what's notable. What's notable is there's one Japanese face in that entire photograph. And my mom was given a job by this camp to be a camp counselor. I did not know this until recently, that this part of North Carolina was once the pencil capital of the world. And the uh, camp president ordered from the pencil factory 200 custom-made chopsticks and then had the camp chefs make uh, Japanese fried rice as a meal 
in honor of my mom's presence there in the camp in the summer of 1943. Uh, Alan and Elizabeth Hunter. My name is Lance Allen Ito. Lance is for Lance Smith, who was an attorney in La Puente, California, who helped my family after the war to try to recover some of their property. Alan is for Alan Hunter. He was the pastor of the Mount Hollywood Congregational Church. There was a, uh, an allied church, the Japanese and Hollywood Japanese Independent Church. When they were interned, he took their personal belongings and furniture and stored it in the enormous basement of the Mount Hollywood Congregational Church. Mount Hollywood Congregational Church is a fabulous church. When we came back to Los Feliz, uh, we, my family joined this church. Uh, Hugh Beaumont, known as Ward Cleaver, was a, an usher. John Anson Ford, member of the Board of Supervisors, was a deacon. Marnie Nixon was in the choir. Google Marnie Nixon, if you don't know who she was. And uh, James B. Taylor, the first African American to become an executive in the LAUSD, uh, was my Sunday school teacher. So it was a fabulous church experience. Ryerson Steel in Chicago hired dozens and dozens and dozens of my family members, my extended family members, to work in the steel mills in Chicago. Remember, steel is a critical wartime material, and you don't want traders or saboteurs working in your steel mills. Ryerson Steel said, we love these people. They're good workers. We'll take more. Which, of course, brings us to suit suits. Now, what is, what is this doing here? <laughs> the good news is that there are more and more interpretations and presentations of this experience. Luis Valdez currently has a play at the Mark Taper Forum, which I encourage you to, to take a look at. Uh, it has to do with uh, a Mexican family and a Japanese family at the time of the outbreak of World War II and, and covers some of the human issues involved. Also, right here on campus, the Sisters Matsumoto. This is about a family returning after the internment. So the good news is that we're getting some play. Let me close by inviting you to, should you be in Jackson Hole or visiting Yellowstone or going, my favorite, the rodeo in Cody, uh, if you happen to be in that part of the world, please come by and visit the Heart Mountain Interpretive Learning Center. It is a world-class museum. And now the root cellar is open. It's an easy walk from, from the Interpretive Center. Uh, please take a look at that. My dad would be thrilled to death if you do that. Anyway, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Judge Ito. This has been a wonderful event, a wonderful legacy for Victor Wolfenstein. I, if you would like to help support future events of this kind, you can go to the Political Science Department website and click on Contribute. Um, and I hope to see you all next year for the next year's uh, memorial to Victor Wolfenstein. Good night.